CBC TV program, The Nature of Food. Vandana Shiva spoke from Dehradun, India, and David Suzuki from Quadra Island in British Columbia in a conversation moderated by Suresh Rao of Indian Summer Festival. The event was recorded on May 23, 2020. Both of you have written recently about the, the situation with COVID-19 and the title of this talk is because in some ways, both of you have said it's a wake up call. What cracks do you think the virus has highlighted? What does it make us realize about ourselves and the world we've built? I think the first crack for me that the virus has exposed is in this model of limitless growth, which is based on limitless greed and limitless extraction and therefore ever since the days of the early conquest 500 years ago treating limits as an obstruction that must be removed whether they be planetary limits or they be ecosystem limits or they be species limits after all of the 300 new infectious diseases most have come from the forest where an ecosystem has been invaded and in those ecosystems are people are animals and these viruses are not deadly in the forest, but they become deadly when we drive these viruses out of the forest. The second thing it has definitely done is show a crack in the industrial food system, not just because the big supply chains collapsed. In India, it's only, you know, the Navania communities were able to feed themselves, but it also has exposed the fact that these viruses become far more fatal because of a food system that's designed for profits rather than health. Food is supposed to be health. Food is medicine. And yet most of the chronic diseases of our times are food induced. The cancers, the neurological diseases, just add the list. And the research is there so clearly that uh, while the, um, the risks of fertility and mortality is about 1%, with just an infection, it jumps to 9.2% with diabetes, with air pollution. Look at what's happening in New York. I think what it has also shown the cracks in is a very manipulated science. By now, we should have known this is the virus. This is how it came. Yeah. Here are the solutions. If we start to map the many stories, nothing makes sense because geopolitics has become more powerful right now in dealing with this virus than science. Another crack that has opened up is, of course, the crack of inequality. We all we were very unequal societies. This inequality had been polarized. I always call globalization a stern relax experiment, just ruptured society. And now with lockdown, half of humanity has been rendered useless. In India, half of the people who are keeping the cities afloat are now being called migrant labor. You are not a migrant in your own country. A new vocabulary of being outsider has been created. Very wrong. They're all citizens. And they've been treated like throwaway people. The other day, one of these people on the road said, we are being treated like abandoned dogs on a street. That is not how nations are supposed to behave. I was just before the lockdown in um, Italy, and they were already talking about, we have to make a decision between who live and who live not. So the have and have not divide is mutating into a live and live not divide. And for me, that's genocide. And we have to avoid it. Those are the conversations we must have. Finally, you know, India is a land of untouchability. We made it illegal in our constitution but in a very strange way because of the heavy overkill of the unscientific aspects of this virus, everyone is treating everyone else as untouchable. The doctors, the nurses, the relatives, people are going burying their own relatives. So it's a vicious untouchability that has been created. And that's why that, you know, the, the manipulated science that has been the part of big pharma and big ag and that David, you and I have fought against so hard. I think it is time to both liberate Mother Earth and liberate science and liberate knowledge so we can live in ways that it makes peace with the Earth and makes us healthy.
one planet, one health is an, is an interconnection we can't avoid. The thing is that we've known this was coming. We've known this was coming. That's why every year the CDC is very carefully watching what's going to happen, expecting something like the Spanish flu to come. And, and every year, you know, they're, they have the uh, vaccinations for flu. But these are all guesses. We've known something was coming. We've lucked out with Ebola, with SARS, with MERS. Somehow we've been able to contain that. And even with HIV, you know, I always think that if HIV had been airborne, man, that would have been it for our species because it has a long latent period when it doesn't express itself. It's passed on through, through sex and blood exchange. Uh, that would have been uh, deadly. So we lucked out on that. But as you say, 60 to 70% of the d diseases, new ones coming out, come from animals. And as we press nature closer and closer, as we clear cut and burn and, and dam, we're pushing species together that normally don't occupy the same area. And viruses can jump from one to another and generate viruses that will ultimately be devastating for humans. So we've known it was coming, and yet we are so unprepared for this. Now we're occupied with this particular event, but anything six months ago seems like ancient history we've forgotten. So, but I would like to remember some of the ancient history because in October of 2018, that seems like ancient history, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a special report telling us that if we don't keep temperature from rising less than 1.5 degrees since pre-industrial times by 2100, this will be absolute climate chaos and catastrophe and called for a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So there was the call. We knew we had to get off fossil fuels and very, very quickly. We, I've always taken pride in the fact that human beings are special because we had have, have something that no other animals have in the way that we do. And that's called foresight. Based on what we learn in our experiences, we look ahead and we see where the dangers lie and where opportunities are. And then we choose a path to avoid dangers and exploit opportunity. And so it's an amazing thing that when it comes to something like climate, we are simply incapable of responding uh, to the depth that we, we have to. Climate change, the conditions leading to the catastrophe continue on. Even with this meltdown and, and lockdown, a uh, reduction of greenhouse gases is still only 17%, uh, which is a huge sh shift, but it's a long way from the 50% that we need by 2030. One day after the IPCC report came out in October of 25th, 2018, marijuana became legal in Canada. And in Canada, all discussion about climate change disappeared from the media. In May of 2019, we got a terrifying report from the United Nations that we are in an extinction crisis. We have already extinguished millions of species and a million more plants and animals are in danger of going extinct very, very quickly. The day after the report came out, Prince Harry and Meghan had a baby and all discussion about a biodiversity crisis disappeared. What kind of a species are we that we get these warnings? We get the scientists telling us that, that there are opportunities to avoid catastrophe. And yet we are, we're not paying any attention. It's been absolutely devastating to me. Vandana, you and I have spent our entire adult careers trying to tell people that there are huge opportunities with shifting direction. But if we don't, the possibilities are catastrophic. What kind of a species are we? Foresight, acting on foresight, has been the very survival mechanism of our species. And now we're ignoring it. And it's obvious that what the issue is, that we now have come to believe that the economy is the source of everything that matters. And this shift, I mean, for most of human existence, we realized that we are embedded in a web of relationships 
relationships with other species of animals and plants, with the air, the water, the sun, the soil. We understood that that complex web of relationships was a very key to our survival and our well-being. That's called an ecocentric way of seeing our place in the world. And there are pockets of people that still cling to that ecocentric worldview. Indigenous people around the world are fighting. They're fighting not for a share of the global economy. They're fighting for the land of which they are a part. And their responsibility is to protect the very source of their health and the world, their well-being. But we've shifted with the scientific uh, innovations, with the industrial revolution, and uh, with the move of people from village agricultural village communities to big cities. We've come to think, you know, most in 85% of Canadians live in a city. We think, well, uh, the most important thing is my job. I need a job to earn the money to buy the things that I want. And so the economy assumes this position. And for nine and a half years in Canada, we had a prime minister who said, we can't do anything about climate change. That's crazy economics. Reducing greenhouse gases will destroy the economy. And so the, he elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons. And so we've come to assume that everything in the world is about us that we're the center of the action and everything out there is an opportunity. Oh yeah, these environmentalists tell us we have to be a little more careful, but it's all about us. And in the world that we've now uh, adopted, there's no reciprocity in receiving. There's no sense of obligation or responsibility. I've been fortunate, privileged to work with indigenous people now for over 40 years. to a feast or a memorial or uh, some kind of celebration. In their songs and their prayers and their dances, they're always thanking their creator for nature's abundance and generosity. And they always acknowledge they have a responsibility to act in the proper way to ensure that nature will continue to be as abundant and generous. That's it. There is no sense of reciprocity in the economic Check out Indians shooting wolves on YouTube. The consequences of what they're doing on the rest of the world. No, it's all about making money. And the loss of that reciprocity, the loss of the understanding that we are part of this web of relationships has created the dilemma that we have today. Mm-hmm. We've been fighting for all these years to try to get people to see their place in the world, and it hasn't worked. Both of you have been warning us about the fact that we're driving our vehicles straight to a cliff, and now that cliff is very much in sight. You brought up an important point, which is the economy, and I think every government around the world now is talking about restarting the economy. And as we take the keys to this um, engine of this vehicle, Um, I I want to ask what kind of vehicle are we starting back up and what do you both think we ought to be watchful for? What do we have to be careful about when we return to normalcy? You know, I think one of the things that uh, I have witnessed get very genetically manipulated is our concepts, our words, our vocabulary. After all, economy is derived from the same word oikos, from which ecology is derived. And managing the household is what all indigenous cultures have done, what women did. And then they had to do the witch hunts to drive women out of managing the households. If you look at the literature on the witch hunts, in early modern Europe. It's all about that expertise that was in harmony with the earth. And when I wrote my first book, Staying Alive, uh, because my publishers heard me give my talk in 1975, uh, in, uh, or 1985 at the the, uh, Nairobi Women's Summit, uh, I went into the roots of how did we divide ourselves and separate ecology and economy, separate humans from nature, Uh, create hierarchies between men and women, treat indigenous people as barbarians and uncivilized. And uh, it it didn't evolve. 
it was imposed. After all, the Chancellor of England became the father of a new modern science and wrote a book, The Birth of Masculine Science. Yeah. Yeah. The masculine birth of time, he called it. That separation is masculinity, domination is masculinity. Enclosing the commons became property, lock. Controlling people and not letting them self-organize as all indigenous cultures do, then became politics. I think we should have a bonfire of these people who created such a mess. But more importantly, since neoliberalism, making money became the religion of our times. You know, it was deregulated commerce. And I went back, I'm writing a dictionary on the economy. Aristotle talked about economy, economy and the art of living. We've always done that. And he called crematistics the art of money making. And I think we must distinguish this because in the period by millions, like I said, half of India, 40 million in the, in the United States, everywhere people just lost their livelihoods, which is part of economy as a living. In that short period, now, in this one and a half months, the super rich made 434 billion additional. That's crematistic. Jeff Bezos, who's trying to destroy every little shop, he destroyed the publishers, now trying to destroy every little shop. They're trying to make it look like if you buy fresh vegetables, it's dangerous for your health. Our food safety authority says you must go via Amazon with its heavy, heavy footprint. Jeff Bezos became richer 24 billion during this short one month of lockdown. And BlackRock, which holds all the money of the billionaires, and then gambles with this money to say, where can we make the quickest money, burn the Amazon for GM soya? BlackRock, $23 trillion assets. So crematistics has grown, but economia has shrunk. And we need to grow the economy in alignment with the earth according to the rules that indigenous cultures evolved with so much discipline, with so much sanctity. And crematistics must be rendered a crime, and that's where our new democratic energy will have to go. To me, we've created an economy that is now based on consumption, and that was a deliberate thing that came out of World War II. After World War II, uh, you know, as the war was coming to an end, the president recognized that uh, you can't keep pumping out guns and tanks and bombs and planes in peacetime. So he said, how do you transform a wartime economy into a peacetime economy? And the answer was consumption. Get people to worship at the altar of consumption, buy stuff, throw it away, and buy more stuff. And that's the, the crisis that we're in now. You know, John Maynard Keynes said way back in the 30s, there are many things that should be global or international, art, sports, uh, music, but for heaven's sake, keep your economy as domestic as possible. During the late 80s, when Canada was debating whether to have free trade with the United States, and one of the eminent economists in Canada was saying, if we don't have free trade with, them, with America, Canada will be an economic basket case. And I thought, what the hell's going on? So I met an eminent economist in the United States named Kenneth Boulding. And I said, Kenneth, we're in danger now of becoming a, an economic basket case without free trade. And he said, if you want to understand how wealthy your country is, just try this thought exercise. Imagine you go to bed tonight, you wake up tomorrow, and the world has disappeared, except for your country and 200 miles of ocean. Would you starve? Canada is one of the breadbaskets of the world. Would you lack for minerals or natural resources? Would you lack for an educated public to make virtually anything that you want? By any criterion you want to apply that way. Canada is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And yet globalization makes us an imminent basket case. This doesn't make any sense to me at all. And so it seems to me that we've got to start thinking hard. You know, we, although we gather food from the sea, uh, we, we still have to buy uh, things at the, the store on this island. And I buy tomatoes and lettuce and coffee and tea. And I know that none of that is being grown in Canada. 
We have a food chain in Canada that's six to 7,000 miles long. All of that fed by fossil fuels. This can't go on, it seems to me. So we've got to rethink our whole relationship with the planet and this elevation of the economy as the source of everything uh, that matters. This is simply a suicidal path. It's harrowing, and, and, I, and I think, you know, what, what was also quite scary for me in, in some of the recent talks and writing you've been doing, we look at tech billionaires, and, you know, um, I think in, in a recent interview, which has now seen a few million views, you compared Bill Gates to Christopher Columbus. What did you mean by that? Well, I think those interviews were when my, my book, uh, Oneness Versus the One Percent, was being released in uh, France. And I wrote the book because 2015 at the climate summit in uh, Paris, Gates was walking around basically instructing the heads of state. And I said, something changed. Something has changed that heads of state are now every boys for billionaires. Of course, having worked on globalization with the IFG, uh, worked on my national systems, I, you know, I kept watch that the first meeting of WTO deregulated trade in information and software. That is where Microsoft made so much money. And the relocation of software to India saved these tech companies 40 billion a year. That's why it's not an accident. There's so many Indians in software. Now, every tech giant is headed by an Indian. I know they're bright, but I think it's also to get the big Indian market. Why do I call Bill Gates a Columbus? What was Columbus's role? He thought he was coming to India. That's why he made the mistake of calling all the diversity of indigenous First Nations Indians. But basically his instruction from the Pope through the King and Queen was go conquer lands and civilize the barbarians, create colonies. Well, Bill Gates is creating colonies. My book was because I saw he was creating not just recolonizing Africa through the failed Green Revolution, on which I wrote my book, The Violence of the Green Revolution. We know it has devastated the earth, the soil, the state of Punjab, so prosperous, now ruined. 75% of the youth of Punjab, drug addicts. The opiate crisis and the addiction crisis and the way people have had to deal with the multiple crisis created by an absolutely anti-nature, anti-people economy. But Gates is then pushing the new GMOs because of their side effects. One editing of a gene leads to 1,500 changes. But he wants gene editing, he wants gene drugs. Pushing pieces, species to extinction, the consciousness. At Paris, he, you know, geoengineering was a big solution. Well, if we've messed up the climate, because of greenhouse gas emissions and emissions from industrial agriculture, which as my book Soil Not Oil shows is 50% of all the greenhouse gases, the food system is 50% of the problem. And a good agriculture system could be 100% of the solution. But Bill Gates is talking of geoengineering, manipulating the entire planet's climate, which to me is a crime. It's a crime against the earth. It is an ecocide. Digital genomic mapping, you know, we've just had another cyclone in the Bay of Bengal. It's not that we didn't have this cyclone, but they have increased in velocity and increased in intensity and increased in frequency, beginning with the super cyclone of 1999. Because I had been saving seeds through Navdanya, we had soil tolerant and flood tolerant seeds, which we could distribute, multiply, distribute. After every cyclone, agriculture has to bounce back, these seeds are distributed. Bill Gates struts around saying he, he has helped invent a sub-gene of flood tolerance. All you do is steal it. I call him a new pile pirate. That piracy is part of colonialism. While we look at the past economy and what was wrong with it, I do think each of us needs to be thinking of the future economy these tech giants and the new Columbuses want to create. There's some things that need to be done during a pandemic. Distancing. I, I prefer to use physical distancing and not allow the term social distancing to become the pattern because separating society is not the objective, just physical distancing. Yeah, okay, for a while don't let the kids go to school. But why are you then creating systems where children will never go to school and you give money to Cuomo, the New York governor, 
who says, oh, why are we spending money on these buildings? So they're now turning the temporary measures of management of the corona epidemic into permanent measures for creating a new empire based on digitalization. I've just written my new piece for World Biodiversity Day because I believe we are part of the earth, we are animals, we are living, we are biology, we, our species being is shared with other species beings. For 500 years of colonialism made us forget we are part of the earth. Industrialism made us forget we are part of the earth. And now the new forced digitalization, chosen digitalization is different. Forced digitalization, new patents, uh, patent, world patent for Microsoft, 060606. To mine our data, our bodily activity, turn us into users of their gadgets. We are users, no more human beings, no more sovereign. And then evaluate us of what we are worth and allocate cryptocurrency to us. Google, talking about implants to ensure we are permanently in a surveillance system. And there's a brilliant economist of Harvard who's written a book, Surveillance Capitalism. So we are in such a strange situation now. If fossil fuels did harm, the idea of big data as the new oil is creating a new problem. Globalization gave us the corporate state where money ran our governments. You're listening to Vandana Shiva and David Suzuki on the pandemic wake up call. This is independent alternative radio. You can order CDs of this program by calling 1-800-444-1977. That's 1-800-444-1977. If you'd like a free copy of a printed transcript or PDF or MP3 of this program, just give us a call at 1-800-444-1977. This new economy that the billionaires, the tech billionaires are trying to create is basically a surveillance corporate state, which means an end to freedom. But it also means a further distancing from the earth, a further pretense that we are dematerializing. I've had debates with Gates and his representatives. We are dematerializing the world. I say, you steal a seed, you still steal a seed. You might have made a genome map. But the general map is still for a pattern to control the real seed that gives us real food. Dematerialization, every cryptocurrency transaction takes as much energy as a Canadian household for an entire month. We are talking about more invisible, heavier ecological footprint, but worse, a loss of our humanity. Every community should be saying, what was wrong in the past economy? What do we have to do now to make sure this pandemic is controlled? And what are the future economies we will build that work for the earth, are in service of the earth, are in service of community, and we don't become two classes of people? A large number of throwaway people, they talk the language of useless people. And I don't think it's an accident that such large numbers of workers in India have just been trashed. They want 10% as their digital slaves. 90% throwaway people. That is unacceptable for me as one humanity on a shared planet. I really feel that message and I want to come back to something that David touched upon as well, which is I think both of you argue for deglobalization and the building of smaller communities. At the same time, you both think and have impact and are speaking of a, of a global fellowship. So what's the kind of globalization you'd both like to see? I did my first television series in 1962 and I saw at that time how poorly Canadians understood or appreciated the impact science was having on their lives and I felt it wasn't right to just leave decisions on the application of science to industry and uh, politicians. I could see the application by the military, by industry and, and medicine and I felt the public had to be uh, to learn from this and I wanted to provide better and better information now, even back then in the 60s we the 1960s we called the uh, television the boob tube I knew that television programs it was like a cesspool but I thought my programs would glisten like jewels among all of the things in, in the cesspool 
and they would favor it and learn from it. But what I found is when you jump into a sex cesspool, you look like a turd like everybody else. People <laughs> use it. And, and look at what's happened now. We have access now in a little cell phone to this vast amount of information. We've got huge access to information. Most of it is about selling stuff or pornography. And uh, what I find now is people don't use information the way I thought. What they do now is they turn through the media, the internet till they find a, a website that says exactly what they already believe. Yep. You want to believe global warming is a hoax? There are dozens of websites that will tell you that. You want to believe in the crazy ideas, you know, UFOs came to Earth and bred with human beings? There are websites about that. I mean, there are people that still absolutely cling to the belief that the Earth is flat. And so the, the problem with this spewing of information, which we share at the speed of light, is that we can have we can have meetings like this. But the fact is that that's not how people are, are educating themselves. They're simply confirming their own prejudices and prejudgments. And, and they can cite, uh, oh, well, I had a website here that said uh, uh, global warming is, uh, is baloney, you know? The climate's always changed, uh, nothing different. We still Mass have to be globally uh, uh, plugged in, I guess, to gain information. But we have to really focus on local communities becoming much more self-sustaining and uh, self-sufficient, I think. I see globalization as the process that started with Columbus and the East India Company. And it isn't that international trade wasn't taking place before that. After all, the reason why both Columbus and East India Company needed to leave Europe was because India was 25% of the world economy with our amazing spices, with our amazing textiles. And they wanted to control that trade. A bag of pepper used to exchange for its weight for a bag of gold. And they wanted the pepper and the gold international trade is not globalization forced trade is globalization where you destroy the local economy and in these 30 years of neoliberal corporate driven globalization i have watched so much get destroyed my life has gone protecting the sea because they tried to have intellectual property in the wto and we said no you don't invent the sea dumping with subsidized grain wiping out farmers making it illegal for us to make our own cold pressed virgin mustard oil made illegal in 98 by million cold pressed mills were criminalized and i had to do a second way at that time for me, is gonna i die think the corona pandemic and lockdown has shown us that deglobalization can happen and it has happened and let's just make this permanent not the surveillance part you know here is the part we should choose to say Deglobalization is worth maintaining. Surveillance is worth shedding. For me, our relationship internationally is as planetary citizens in a planetary civilization. And that means you don't have to move goods around. You have to move ideas around, as you do in the Indian Summer Festival. You have to connect through consciousness, not through container. You know, the domination of the big giant container trucks and container ships is so obscene to me because I've grown up in a world without them. And as I see it take over more and more and more, and I watch these giant ships with these giant containers, I said, why are we destroying local economy by fabricated rules written by the corporations to make their market grow? And it is not the case that these goods stop moving just because you became digital. After all, more footprint is happening because of the e-commerce of Amazon. If I go to my local vegetable vendor, my ecological footprint is very low and a livelihood is created in the process, a relationship is created in the process. But these giant packages, the exploitation of the workers, of the delivery system, the warehouse workers, why is Amazon having strikes? It's because it is still dealing with people. It's still dealing with goods, except that it's monopolizing by not paying taxes and getting privileges of every kind. During the lockdown, every government was used by Jeff Bezos to make it possible for them to deliver while local shops were shut down. I think local economies is the only way we can reduce our ecological footprint we in India, through the Chipko movement, we used to call ecology 
the economy of permanence. That's why instead of saying economy is bad, let's take it back. It's meant to be about ecology. We can only create economies of permanence locally, shift from fossil fuels to craft-based system, because fossil fuels mean industrialism. Our love affair with industrialization must end. And for my dear friends in the environmental community of the West who use the word civilization, shed it. As Gandhi said, it might be a good idea, but industrial civilization cannot be civilized because it has to predate on so much of the planet, as he said, in one little island nation has kept the whole world in chains. What will happen if everyone industrializes? How many planets will we need? It is already happening, the overshoot of needing 5, 10, 11 planets that we don't have. This is the only planet we have. So we've got to reduce our ecological footprint and we have to de-industrialize, we have to de-globalize, de-industrialize, de-mechanize. The mechanical mind is such a mischief maker. You know, our work, David, on genetic engineering, where you take complex systems and reduce them to an assumption of a particle that's not related to anything else, and you can move it like a Lego said. We have to deconsumerize. Our citizenship comes from serving the earth, caring for the earth, caring from community. Our citizenship is in fact lost when we blindly consume without knowing what it's costing the earth and other people. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I find it amazing that Bezos and, and uh, all of these people are worshipped, are celebrated, are admired in our society. It's an obscenity that anyone could be worth a billion dollars. We used to think millionaires were really something. They're not talking about the first trillionaire that is coming. I'm very struck on the coast of British Columbia, the coastal First Nations, the indigenous people, have uh, an event called a potlatch. When Europeans arrived here, they said, look at these savages. They don't have any sense of pro ownership and property because you have to earn the right to throw a potlatch. And in the potlatch, you give away everything you possess because you get in return status within the community you get to carve a ring around the top of your totem pole and if you have three rings there boy you are one of the most admired people here it all seems to be how rich can you be but you can't build bigger and bigger houses and bigger buy bigger planes and bigger boats like what the hell do they need we need a mechanism to limit the amount of wealth you have, which is way beyond what is necessary, and to provide, okay, we'll give, the, uh, we'll give them status, we'll give them recognition, but for heaven's sake, let's shift that around. It's inequity, the terrible inequity now that is driving the destruction of this system that we have. We've got to sit down and ask, what the hell is an economy for? How much is enough? Are there no limits? My great fear is that coming out of this crisis, we're going to have our leaders just trying everything they can to get things back up going the way they were before the crisis. That's what we did in 2008, 2009, when we had the economic meltdown and Bush and, and Obama poured tens of billions of dollars into the banks that had created the crisis in the first place. Not one of them has gone to jail. And, all they, and there were no strings attached to the money being given. We, they said, just please get back up going again. Too many uh, corporations have been put out of business. Please get back up. And, they, and it worked. The stock market rose and everything went back. And my fear, if you look to the United States, is that's the whole drive, is to get that economy going again without learning a damn thing from this crisis. And that will be a tragedy if we don't learn some fundamental lessons. Thank you both uh, for that. And in fact, I'm, um, I think a lot of people, we have five continents and 17 countries watching right now. And, and there's a lot of people wanting your guidance, in fact, uh, on being watchful and, and what they can do, um, calls to action really in this moment. Um, Siddharth and Manisha from the Adavi Trust in India. Call to action. Get out there and enjoy it while you still can. What do you think? Are you going to get out there and enjoy those chippies while you still can like that? 